Hello? Can you hear me? So Okay, good. So since you can hear me, um, let's just get it started. Um, so this will be the first time I uh, ever use English to do a, to do a talk on YouTube on live. Um, thanks for coming in and uh, joining me on this talk. Um, so the topic of today's talk would be use Python for data science. And I just gave a very basic introduction um, so first of all, I introduce myself. Let me just put this on full screen. <clears throat> so my name is Richard, uh, last name Xie. Um, currently, I'm a principal data scientist at Threat Track Security. And you can find my LinkedIn profile at the link here. Um, I'm also a recreational innovator, I would call myself. And I um, built a website called, called uh, talenttail.com and I also uh, created and host a few uh, WeChat Chinese groups related to data science. Um, so for now, most of the members are sp Chinese speaking, uh, but in the future, if we have more and more English speaking people interested in joining the WeChat group, I don't I don't see any problem creating an English group for uh, data science related topics. And I'm also a blogger. I, I like writing blog posts um, on LinkedIn. You can find my posts on this link, just under my LinkedIn profile. And um, uh, th this picture, just a snapshot of some of the uh, my recent blog posts. So um, I'm really a believer of knowledge sharing, and uh, I. I uh, I'm very interested in creating a community of, for data scientists and also for the law, lover of data science, who, whoever is interested in knowing um, how to be a data scientist and what data science is doing. So that's why I'm here, just share my own experience and the knowledge with, with all of my friends. And uh, it just, you know, from myself, if there's anything wrong, any, any error, that's all me. Um, so I take the full responsibilities. Um, why this talk? So um, I, I've known a lot of people who are interested in getting into data science field. They are either students, you know, still in school or looking for uh, jobs as a data analyst or data scientist. Uh, or some career changers. They may um, have jobs in um, other fields, in other engineering fields, but they would like to, um, you know, turn their career into a data scientist or something like that. Uh, but they don't know much about, you know, what data scientists do every day or what kind of skill set they need. Um, and also, um, we also know some traditional statisticians. They're very strong in statistics you know they are experts of SAS, uh but you know motivated by the recent growth of data science especially the big data you know a lot of buzzwords uh in here uh about you know how big data is changing our life and um you know what data science is playing a significant role in big data so they're interested and they would like to know more so this talk is majorly tailored for for them for for those people who are new either new or either you know just get interested in data science so first if you want to be a data scientist you want to get into a new uh profession you need to pick the right weapon to fight a good battle so there are you know uh, we are um, we're using 
computers every day. So the weapon we use is basically a programming language. There are a few um, programming language we can choose. One, you know, definitely is, is R or Python. Uh, another is SAS. It's very uh, has has a very strong footing, you know, in in the analytic field. And Scala is very new. Uh, it's getting a lot of um, you know uh, momentum. And the Java is you know is always strong. So there are a lot of programming tools to choose. Um, but you know which one which one is right for you? I you know that's 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 something I would like to talk. So um, I'm a very strong com in, uh, advocate for Python. Um, the reason is I have been using SAS for about a year, and uh, that really drives me crazy. So I tried R, but very quickly I turned to Python uh, because Python has everything I, I want. So first, um, it's, it's called a glue language. So it, it can be used almost everywhere. So it, you know, the term for that is jack of all trades. You can do scientific computation. Uh, it can develop the GUI in you know, a graphic user interface. Uh, it can you know can develop the GUI program programs, and it can do the web programming. You know, develop website. You know, it can also do the very uh, low le low level uh, network and the communication programming, uh, and it you know it just can inter interface with almost everything you can do the you know the scraping uh, you know a lot of time we need to collect the data then we can scrape web pages and collect data from internet so that's a that's a huge resource of, of data and it's particularly suitable for data science I will cover that in in the in in the later slides uh, and it has a very wide variety of mature, mature packages and ex extremely active community. You know, we have Stack Overflow, we have GitHub. Uh, um, you have you, you, whatever questions you may have, you can find answers. And it's very easy to learn. And, uh, you know, the last but not least is free. Um, so that's very important for me. And, um, you know, when, when I was choosing a programming language just to start with, I basically just compare a, a list of few metrics and check, you know, uh, what those programming language uh, satisfy those metrics. So the first is Python, the, the first metric is, is a versatile enough, you know, it, because we have the time opportunity. You learn something, you would like to apply what you learned to as many uh, um, fields or as many things as possible. So if it's very versatile, that means what you learned will be very, very, very uh, you know, useful and valuable in many, many fields, if, you know, almost everywhere. So versatile, versatility is very important. And um, uh, as a newcomer or, uh, um, you know, um, a student uh, which has very fresh knowledge, you know, you want to have a get support from from the senior people. So if you have a active community, then you can get answers for your questions. You know, what you have experienced, you know, has been experienced by hundreds or thousands of other people. So you can get help from them. And also, you know, it, it will, you can turn to help others. If you get more and more experience and the knowledge, you can join the community and help them. And does it have a rich libraries? Uh, that's very important. You know, for the open source community, um, every everybody can contribute, you know, the libraries, the packages. Um, they can develop their own libraries and, and share that with other people, with other users. Um, and also, is it easy to learn? You know how 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 steep the learning curve is. You know, if you have to spend five years to learn a programming language, then spend another two years to find a job. You know, that's 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 just too slow. You know, you wish you want to spend just like two, three months or six months to get a very good hold of one programming language, then uh, then, then do some practical uh, projects. Then you, you you gain real life experience. Then you can find a good job. And is it free or not? Because you know, uh, we don't really have a lot of money in our personal expense to buy 
you know, a soft wall. So Python satisfies all the metrics in R. Um, it's, it has a active community. It has the rich libraries and it's relatively easy to learn the use It's free, but you know, I don't think it's versatile enough. Uh, it still, it can do a lot of things, but it, compared to Python is, is, is a little, a little bit less versatile and the Java is very versatile. It's, it's everywhere. It can do everything. Uh, it definitely has a very active community and also has rich libraries, but it's just a little bit hard, harder to learn and the use, but it's free. So Java definitely is a, is a strong candidate. Scala is another one. It's very good. And the SAS is, you know, um, <clears throat> so 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 it has active community but it's very expensive but you know sometimes you just don't have the opportunity to choose because the company you you're working uh you know like for pharm pharmaceutical company or, or bank they just use SaaS. they only trust SaaS, so you have no choice but using SaaS. that's okay that's totally fine SaaS is good SaaS is wonderful but i just don't like it uh anyway so I'm um, keep going on Python. Um, in for Python, the most well known or most used Python libraries for data science, are uh, of there are many, you know. But the fundamental libraries, including the NumPy and SciPy and the Pandas. So NumPy uh, take care of the the numerical computation, the matrix computation, and the SciPy is a package has a lot of functionalities in scientific computation. It's more like uh, the, the combination of NumPy and the SciPy in a, uh, can match MATLAB. And the Pandas is, uh, is it's, it's definitely what you need to do the de data analysis in, in Python. It, it's super cool. Um, it use something like um, the data frame in R um, and to do a lot of um, um, the data processing, data cleaning, data transformation, um, and some statistics as well. And the, both SciPy and the Pandas has uh, a lot of statistics built in. But other than that, there's a um, very dedicated statistics in the math package is called the stats models. So um, if, if there's some statistical model you cannot find in SciPy or Pandas, um, very likely you will find it in stats models. Um, and for machine learning, you know, there's no doubt scikit-learn is the best. You say that's just one, you know, the, this one is big enough, it's good. So once you get um, started on scikit-learn, you will definitely won't regret and you will like it very much. You just stick to it. Um, but it's not all. There are still some small uh, packages here and there to deal with different machine learning uh, problems. But in general, the, uh, the machine learning package in Python is um, scikit-learn. It's, it's a very big umbrella, covers a lot of things in, uh, in machine learning. And it, when it comes to visualization, the you know the king is the mat, matplotlib is is very popular, is very powerful, uh, and uh, very detailed um, visualization package. With mat, matplotlib, you can do a, a very beautiful visualization, but just with the default setting, you can make the plots also beautiful. And the seaborn is is even more beautiful than matplotlib by the default setting. So Seaborn is, is a newcomer, but it's also very, very good. Plotly, you know, definitely is very good too, traditionally. Um, it's it's a, a cross-platform uh, visualization package. There are more libraries for like, um, for particular <clears throat> applications. For the natural processing, for the natural language processing, you will definitely use NLTK. And uh, for uh, high dimensional uh, mathematical expression, uh, computation optimization, uh, you will use Theno. Uh, but Theno is more like a, a fundamental support. It's acting more like a fundamental support for the deep learning package in Python. Um, when you are dealing with Spark or Hadoop, 
um, you have PySpark or Hadoop Pi to uh, interface with uh, Hadoop and the Spark uh, to do the map reduce uh, computation on Hadoop or uh, do the Spark computation on Spark. And we, when you are uh, working with uh, data servers, uh, a database or data servers, either uh, SQL data server like ODBC, traditional ODBC, um, MySQL, um, SQL, SQL Server, or Oracle SQL, uh, you can use PyPy ODBC. When you're working with Cassandra, you can use PyCasa. And when you're working with Elasticsearch, you have Elasticsearch Py. Um, I use my Mongo a lot, so I use PyMongo to interface with uh, um, uh, MongoDB. Um, it's very, very convenient. And uh, uh, when you're doing the uh, feature engineering, like doing the uh, feature selection, there is a new uh, Python package called Scikit feature. It includes like a lot of uh, feature selection methods uh, implementation there. Uh, XGBoost has a uh, very good Python binding as well. XGBoost is a um, is a ensemble method of um, um, of classifier, do, building a classifier, but it can also do the uh, regression model. Um, it's very powerful uh, and has win a lot of uh, computation in Kaggle. Um, and uh, it com when it comes to um, deep learning. Uh, we definitely have a lot of uh, very good Python packages. Uh, some of them, like Cafe, uh, TensorFlow, and the MX, MXNet, they are just the examples of the good uh, uh, deep learning packages in Python. And there are many, many more. I just cannot list all of them. And I don't use all of them. Uh, you know, so basically, what we have to learn is, you know, is is is. Um, purpose driven is application driven project driven it depends on what business problem you want to solve um so but you know because python is so easy to learn uh when you need some new tool um you just can uh you know take advantage of the the very basic uh python programming language then use that in the tool in the new new package, then you just take that, read the documentation, try uh, one or two tutorials, then you will get a good hold of it. So that's that's how I learned. Um, what would be the next? Um, the next, I, I will give some uh, demos, uh, you know, because limited of the time, I have to give short demos. Uh, first, I will cover some very basic um, mm, knowledge of Python, you know, the basic points of Python. Then I will cover time series, link analysis, uh, like similar, similarity analysis, you know, uh, calculate the similarity across items and uh, uh, how to find the similar items. And uh, I personally like um, visualization a lot. So the next I will, I will do some graph network visualization. Then, you know, I will, uh, jump into regression then do some dimensionality reduction and the classification. So all of those, uh, you know, the very common topics in machine learning and the data science. And uh, and as a data scientist, uh, I'm kind of deal with uh, one or two topics every day, uh, not all of them on a single day, but, you know, one day here, one day there. So all of them, you know, it's just coming from my own experience. Um, so that's what I uh, feel is important. So uh, next, just check um, the status and see. Okay, it seems okay. Um, top. Okay, uh, first let's start the iPod. I, I um, not this one. I'll start IPython notebook. So this is a, a very good application for demonstration in Python. Um, so it's a web-based application and it shows um, the notebook I have in the current directory. So first I will demonstrate some very basic um, Python operation. Uh, let me clear all the cells first. 
Um, so I will show you how um, how Python deal with the basic data types. So the first is in a definitely integer. Uh, we can um, because you don't have to define a, a, a type for variable and um, uh, Python will infer the, uh, the type of a, a variable by itself. So when you say um, a variable named as a uh, underscore int equal to four, it will just get uh, infer that as a, a, a um, you get a type, you say um, the type of this variable, it will answer, it will give you the answer as an integer. Then you give another variable uh, as a value of a 4.2, uh, then give the value, assign the value 4.2 to the variable a float, then uh, check the type of this variable, then it will give you um, the type as a float. Uh, when you need to do the math calculation or computation, uh, you need to import path. Um, so or import math package. Um, all, all of the basic computation um, in in Python um, are included in, in the math package. So let me let me just double check. Is everything okay? Yeah, because this is just one-way traffic. I don't know. Um, I, I just cannot get um, the interaction from from the audience. Uh, uh, you can send me. You can send me the um, the feedback on WeChat uh, if there's any problem with uh, with the broadcasting. So, um, like, if we want to get the pi value. Uh, we can just use uh, after we imported the path math package, then just use math.py to get the value and assign the value to the variable pi. Um, yes. Okay, here you go. Then you can check what's the value of the variable pi. It, was, it give you the right value for the pi. Then you can do the calculation uh, of with uh, with the variable. Then you can compute. Um, the a float uh, to the power of pi, then get the value of the result. So that will be the right result, I hope. Then you can, uh, because we deal with a lot of random number, you need to generate random number all the time. So random number is being taken care of by a package just called random. So when we import a, uh, a package, we can give a, a short name for the package, like we import random package as RD. So RD will be uh, the short name, the acronym for, for random package. So uh, in the future, when we use this package, we just use RD to refer to this package. Um, so let's, let's run this, then so first we import random package, then generate a random number and assign the random number to the variable a underscore rd. Then we can check the value of this uh, variable. It's a variable between zero and one. If you run it again, you probably will get a, a different random number. Um, so that's why it's called a random number because every time you probably will get, you know, because we didn't set a random seed, so every time you will get a random number when you run the random function. Um, a very um, uh, useful function in a random package, um, okay, um, okay, so some, some people can get a very clear image, but some not. Um, don't worry, you know, uh, we will, the YouTube will archive the broadcasting, so um, you can always come back and, um, and uh, watch the video uh, whenever it's convenient to you. So uh, sometimes we want to get a random choice between a set of, you know, within a set of numbers. So like in this function, we would like to choose a random number between uh, one and one hundred, and actually it's one to ninety-nine. 
So uh, we can call the choice function in the random package. When we run this, it will just randomly pick a number between this range. Then let's let's check what, what the number it got. We'll get 66. When you do that again, you probably will get another number. So um, it will be very interesting or very useful when you do the sampling, but usually we don't do that. But sometimes you need to randomly choose a, a value uh, in a list of uh, numbers. You can do that. Um, then uh, another thing, uh, we can do the random sampling with with random package. Like first, uh, we generate um, uh, 60 lottery numbers. So uh, after that, after run this, uh, you can see what's the length of this lottery. So first, you probably wonder what the type of this. So this uh, lottery numbers is a long name. So it's a list. Uh, we will cover list. We'll talk about list in, in, uh, in a second. Then once you have this variable generated, then you can just random uh, get a sample of the you can you want to uh, get a, a random sample of six values from this lottery numbers, then you will get exactly six numbers. And every time you will get the different different samples. So that's a random package. Then another thing is string package. We deal with string all the time. Uh, you know, when you are doing the text text mining, you know, NLP, uh, natural language processing, or just deal with some CSV files or whatever, you will deal with string all the time. So it's very easy to assign a string to a variable, just uh, a variable name equal to a string. Um, then you can get the length of stream. So basically, a string is just a list of characters then the length of string is the number of characters in the string, uh, including the space. Um, then a lot of time we deal with date, date time, then uh, import the date time as, a, you know, as DT, a short name for, for this package. We can get the current date time, date and the time. Then we can check what, what the value is, is uh, the year is 2016 March 29 and uh, hour 21 and the 26 minute and the 53 seconds so we can convert this string into something different let's say um, just uh, con just put the uh, strings together concatenating the, 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 them together then you will see uh, a string is is a string at this time uh, timestamp. Uh, then we can replace a uh, substring like this eight uh, symbol with um, with uh, at at uh, word with word at. We can just use the replace of the string function. Then it will replace that. So we can um, when you check the value of string a string. Uh, there's no the, the symbol is not there anymore, but it's replaced by AT. So it become a string at uh, this timestamp. Uh, sometimes you want to find a substring, like uh, we were wondering if there's a substring called AT in this long string, we can use the find function. It will give you the index of the first ladder. First ladder of the substring appear in the long string. It will be the position nine. Um, so as we said, um, basically a string is just a list of characters. You can use a, a list operation to get the slice of the string. So when, when we say a string from uh, position three to position five, what you will get? You will get tr. So basically that's this two. Uh, la two uh, ladders. Um, string is immutable. You cannot change uh, um, the value of um, um, a sub, uh, uh, um, you know, a character, a character in a string. So, so this won't work. 
uh, this will not work. So it will give you a, a, a type error because it says uh, the string object does not support item assignment. So um, when you want to do a reassignment of uh, a value, you can use replace. Um, then you can split a string um, based on a, a delimiter. So uh, here we can just use AT as a delimiter, a separator, uh, split based on AT, then you will get array. Um, so, so after we run the split function, then uh, you can check what, what, what the type of is. It's a list. So it's in an array, it's a list as well. So um, like what you get, you, you can see array basically is a two elements list. So the first is a string, which is a substring uh, appear before a t, and uh, in the the timestamp is the the part after the a t uh, the delimiter. So you basically just cut the string in half and uh, put them in a list. And we can hash a string, you know, because string sometimes can be very long, and you want to use. Um, a more economic way to store a string, or for whatever reason you want to um, convert the string into integer, you can do that. So this is a new string. Uh, the variable s is assigned to a value. My name is Richard. Then, uh, then the value of string you can see is my name is Richard. But I want to convert this string into a just eight digits. I, I want to use eight digits to re, uh, just represent this string. So I use this hash function. So first I hash that into a long uh, integer, then get absolute value of the integer, then then um, convert that into eight digits. So that will give you exactly eight digits to represent um, the hash of this long string. And uh, maybe you'll wonder what this uh, hash function do. It just gives you a long uh, integer number, uh, which has no hashing collision uh, would happen, would not happen to this string. But when you hash that into uh, a shorter number of digits, like eight digits, uh, you may run into a problem called a hashing collision. Um, but that's just uh, the advanced topic. Um, I use the list. All every day. Um, so list is definitely very important in uh, data analytics in Python. So basically, the list is just a combination of uh, elements. It can be different types. So here is just a list of uh, string and an integer. You can get uh, assign this list to A and assign another list to B list and uh, put them together. Then let's see what the C list is. So just a um, just um, a combination of the A list and the B list. You can get the uh, the length of this C list. Uh, count how many elements in this list. Um, append is different. It's just append one um, object into the list to the end of the list. So let's say um, we have a new list is called d underscore list is uh, get a get a um, um, a string uh, basically just a string element in the list then uh, append the a list into it then we can see um, what's the value of a list uh, so what we happen what happened is the d list is um, uh, as an object append to the original a list so, uh, no, I'm sorry, the, uh, the A list appended to D list as an object. So it's a list in, within a list. But extend is, is a different. So extend is just take every element in the new list and put that into, uh, into D list. So you will see uh, the new elements, they are the elements in A list and put them one by one into, uh, into D list. And you can pop. Uh, one of the elements, then you can sort uh, a list. Uh, it's very, very straightforward. Okay, I gotta go very quick on this. So dictionary is a just um, a key value map. So each 
element in a dictionary has a key and each key um, corresponding to a value has a value corresponding to a key uh, like assign this to dictionary then can add a new key to this dictionary then it will give you um, the value of this dictionary set is a unique um, kind of list uh, so when you generate a, a list you have duplicated elements in this list so it's okay to have duplicated list, uh, elements in a list but when you turn that into a set um, all the duplication will be removed you will get all the uh, only in the unique list your unique elements in the set and tuples is also some something similar to list um, but you can get uh, it's just uh, put them in the parentheses is in, instead of a, a, a bracket so um, yeah so that's what we have for the table um, in Python uh, it's a little bit different uh, when we define a function it starts with a um, a key word as DF as define then the fun followed by function name then the arguments to this function then followed by a column uh, so the column um, just meaning the start of this definition of the function then you need to indent by um, a certain amount of uh, spaces by default is by four spaces uh, then with this in indention you uh, the Python would know the this part is part of uh, the function definition so we define this function then we can use something uh, this is called um, a list of comprehension um, for just very concise list of computation what, what we have here is uh, called this function which we just defined with parameter s1 and s2 for every s1 and s2 in this zipped uh, combination of two lists so um, one list is string list that goes from zero to um, the second to the last elements and uh, the same list but goes from the first element the second element to the last element so well con con just concate um, this two strings together one by one so you will get a and the b and b and the c c and the d uh, so basically just shift one list by one position then uh, take elements by elements and put them together separated by the symbol of end um, I originally I was planning to cover some parallel programming but I figured it's just a little bit too much so that's the very basic of the Python uh, language and uh, that's pretty much like 80% or even 90% of um, data processing or analytics or operation in Python you may need uh, next I will use some um, 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 like hopefully interesting project to demonstrate how we can use the Python to do some uh, analysis so first we just um, import a lot of packages we will use later first is the matplotlib because we will have some you know our graphing or visualization um, uh, just some minutes later then we'll definitely import the SK uh, scikit-learn package uh, we'll import um, the data sets uh, pre-processing uh, then uh, later on we will import some uh, regression package and the classific classification package as well we will need a numpy to do some matrix computation and the daytime to get time we'll definitely need the pandas and uh, and the pandas io to get some data uh, input and uh, some other csv and the url live to packages um so first you know we deal with uh I deal with time series data and uh, you probably would deal with time series data as well um, pandas is the wonderful tool uh, to deal with um, to work with the time series data so first we um, what, what I imagine in this project is I will um, 
fetch some stock data uh, from Yahoo Finance, uh, then use this uh, stock data to uh, draw some time series plots and uh, uh, do some time series uh, like autocorrelation uh, analysis or smoothing, um, <clears throat> smooth average uh, computation, just, just, just a very quick demonstration of how easy to use pandas to do the time series analysis. So first I define a start date and the end date. So the start date would be um, 2015 January 1st and the and end date would be the March 24th of 2016. Um, okay, what's going on? I need to import the date time package. Then I can run this uh, function. Then what I'm interested in is um, Amazon, the stock of Amazon. So I define a symbol variable for Amazon. Then uh, use um, pandas IO package. Uh, that's what I have imported, the pandas.io.data data as a web. So I use web to refer to this package. Then it has a, a function called data reader. Uh, it's very, very convenient, very, very powerful. So you can read data from multiple uh, sources like Yahoo Finance and Google Finance and Google Analytics and some other data sources. You can check that on the Pandas documentation. Then you just need to give uh, the stock symbol, then uh, identify the source. Uh, you know, for here, we just use Yahoo Finance. Then, then uh, name the start date and the end date. Just run it. Uh, you already have the data before you even notice it. Now you have uh, 309 data points uh, because there are 309 trading dates within this period. And uh, we have six columns. So six, uh, so uh, 309 is the number of rows and uh, six is the number of colon columns. So uh, I would like to see what the data is. Let's see. Um, so if you decide to look all the, all the data, basically it has the index as the, um, as the date. So uh, the date is the index of the uh, data frame. So it return a data frame in pandas. It has six columns. Basically, it's open, high, low, close, and the volume and the adjusted close. So that's what we have uh, when we retrieve the data from Yahoo. So we have day by day stock prices. That's very rich. Then uh, we can plot uh, this time series data uh, in pandas uh, for data frame, we just use IX in the short for index uh, to get a slice of the um, data frame. So here I'm just interested in the high price and the low price. So, um, okay, um, that's good. <clears throat> so then um, there's a built-in function of for applying this uh, time time series curve, so that's just replot it. You will see uh, it will generate a time series curve for uh, the stock of Amazon during this period from uh, the start of 2015 to March 24th of 2016. It definitely has ups and the downs, and the blue. Blue curve is the high price and the green curve is the low price. That's just how easy it is to generate a time series curve. Then you can check the value of um, a single day. So this is the first day of the uh, of this time frame we get. So the time is 2015 January 2nd because January 1st is a holiday. Um, so you get the open price high price, low price, close price, and, uh, and the volume and adjusted price. That's, you can check um, the value by use IX, and you can do the same thing for uh, just get one uh, price type for the open price of that day is $312. Um, now I want to get the, um, uh, the columns as a list. So in pandas, you can take this data frame 
then call uh, columns, get the columns property, and turn that into a list. So now you have uh, a list of the column, uh, the basically the column names, put that into a list. Then you can check what's, what's inside this list. You have open, high, low, close, volume. So we will use that later. Uh, then some very basic uh, time series analysis, like we can ca calculate the rolling mean of this, uh, um, the raw data, because the raw data is very bumpy, uh, it's very noisy. But uh, we, can, we can get uh, the rolling mean of this um, raw data, use a window of 12 days, and plot that uh, smooth the curve, it's much smoother. Uh, you can see it's much smoother than the plot we have. Um, then you can calculate the rolling correlation between two variables. Here I'm plotting the, uh, the, the rolling correlation between the open price and the close price of the same uh, stock. So uh, you can see um, the correlation is very high, it's above 98%, but it's totally understandable because you know, when you have a, uh, uh, so open price and the close price, you know, usually go together. Um, you know, when we analyze stocks, uh, each stock has, you know, their own absolute values, you know, some are in hundreds, some are in cents, you know, in pennies. So um, it's, it's, it's not fair just to compare one stock price to another a lot of time we're more interested in the percentage change. Uh, in Pandas, there's a function called PCT underscore change. It just calculates the percentage change given uh, a period, over a given period. So here, I um, just want to calculate the price change uh, in one day, like um, how much the price changed, like compared uh, today's price compared to yesterday. Then I will, um, call this function and, uh, and uh, give uh, the period of uh, one to this function, then just get the price change information. Uh, then we can check what's the value in this. Uh, first, let's see what's this um, variable type. It's, uh, it's a series. This is a series of uh, in Panda. Then we can plot that as well. So here we removed, um, the trend and the and the basically we just get a, um, a random walk of the percentage change. It's more like a random walk because the mean of this series is in zero and uh, the the standard deviation you know um, it varies. So it's it's not a stationary uh, process. Um, we can tell from this plot. There are a lot of more and more functions, you know, covered in pandas. We just cannot uh, deal with here. We just, what, what I wish is just introduce you to uh, time series analysis, you know, in Python. You can you can count on uh, pandas to do uh, very complicated time series analysis. Um, so the next is I would like to. Um, generate a network graph using the stock data. Um, so um, what I want to do is, uh, so first I want to identify uh, some other stocks which have similar behavior uh, to a certain uh, one stock. You know, the, the behavior, what I define the behavior is the price change because we just, uh, just uh, showed how we do the price change in pandas. So uh, we calculate a, um, the price change for a stock and the compare how similar the price changes in the past day and use that information to identify the similarities between stocks. So first we define a frequent. Um, so I want to calculate the pr percentage change over uh, this a, a list of frequencies like um, go from one day to 20 days apart. So let's uh, define this list. Um, then for each of the frequent and for each type of price, 
I compute and also generate a new columns to um, just accommodate the, the newly computed price, <clears throat> the price change information for different period. Now we have a lot of columns. So we have column, we have original columns of open, high, low, close, and the volume, adjust, adjusted close as we have. But we have some derived columns just calculated from, uh, from uh, running the statements above. We have um, the independent, the I here, just, uh, just indicator of independent variable for open price, um, price change in one day apart uh, for the high price in one day apart, low day, uh, low price for one day apart, and uh, uh, low price for 18 days apart, close price for uh, 18 days apart, until you know goes on to uh, 19 days apart. So, so now this data frame has all the information about how the price um, of this stock has changed um, in terms of you know, yesterday, the day before yesterday, two days before yesterday, until 18 days before yesterday. So we can get the last um, last date, uh, last row of this time frame. So you can you can see how many um, we have a lot of rows here, a lot of columns here, and uh, and the date is March 24th. Then I put that into a function. Uh, so, so this is the uh, statements we have seen, and basically, um, this is the uh, the fetching uh, statement to get the stock data from Yahoo, and I put all of them into a function called prepared changes data because I will call this function later to get function to get the data stock data for a particular stock symbol. Then, um, then basically, I can just call this function for Amazon. So symbol is the variable for Amazon, and this, we have already defined start date and end date and the frequency. So just call this function, then we can get. Um, that's how easy it is to get a, to generate a data frame with all the features you want. Now uh, we want to do this for another two hundred stocks. So first, I want to read a list of. Uh, I want to read a list of um, stock symbols and all of the uh, NASDAQ uh, stock symbols um, in included in this CSV file. And I just open this file as F, um, then read the lines, get all the content. So what we have here is uh, this is just one line in this CSV file. So the first uh, is the symbol. Then you know, you get address, get uh, some uh, pricing, then the market market cap, all the related information. But here we only interest in the symbol. Then for so let's see how <clears throat> the length of content we have three thousand stocks, uh, three thousand ninety six stocks, and but we don't need those. We don't need that many. Uh, but first we want to get all the symbols. So, um, so we use the list of comprehension to read the content information and uh, get the first part of this, you know, uh, so first the split um, column, then take the first element, replace the uh, double, re replace the double quote with, uh, with empty space, then get all the symbols. Then this here is a list of symbol. Then the, the fifth element of symbols is this. It's a it's a one hundred flowers dot com. Um, so I'm just ab arbitrarily choose uh, a symbol. Then you can call the function we uh, defined above to get all the information. And here is the stock information and also the derived columns. Um, for this flower.com stock, then you can get you see what we have. Then, uh, then we want to get the features. We need to get a set of the features for uh, for this data frame. So, because we already when we define the derived columns, we just set the trick. We have uh, I underscore uh, just prefix the columns 
which we uh, we generated, then we use them as the features. Then you can, you know, one thing about uh, uh, one thing good about a notebook is you can use um, comma to suppress output. Then here you can just see uh, what's the value in this list. So, so um, this list would be the, all the features we want to use in the in the next step for. Uh, similarity computation or uh, regression and uh, classification. So you, you see the length of it is 95 elements. Then uh, you can check the uh, shape of this time frame. Is it also have 309 rows and the 101 columns? Um, you can get the um, the last row of this data frame, you use tail function and to tell them how many tails, you know, basically how many rows in, in the tail you want to get. I just want to get the last row, so I pass one to this tail function and I'm only interested in the features I defined. So you will get uh, the last line, the last row, which is the most recent date is March 24th of 2016. And also get all the features generated from uh, this time fr data frame. Then um, import a system package. Then uh, we want to uh, get a new series of data and use that time period to get the stock data, then compute. We, we, we want to get 200 stocks and identify uh, which stock are most similar to this uh, 100flower.com, this particular stock. So let's start doing that um, and initiate uh, a new list. It's called all stocks and, uh, and also initiate a uh, list for my symbols. Um, then here is just um, it's a loop to get 200 stocks from the symbols, um, the symbol list I have prepared, which have more than 3,000 symbols, stock symbols. I only need 200 of them. So I will call uh, this function to retrieve the data and put the data into this list and also append the symbols into this my symbol list. Then I, will, I just I just run this. Uh, depends on my internet speed. You will uh, you will see it already get twenty stocks, uh, forty stocks. We are we are on on the good progress. There are some symbols uh, not recognized by Yahoo Finance. So I just raise our arrow, um, but just keep going. The program it just keep going. We already got one hundred stocks data. Then keep going one hundred twenty. Uh, for 140, 160. Let me check. Now we have 180 stocks. When we get 100, one, uh, when we get 200 stocks, it's done. So we have. Um, let's check what's the size of this all stocks. So we have 201 because um, we have the 100, uh, the flower.com as the first stock, then we get another 200. So we have 201 stocks and uh, each of them has 91, uh, 95 columns. Um, so um, we can just use the um, the price change information for for the close price. How we do that? We can just get a subset of the features. Use a uh, just use a list list comprehension. You know, I use list comprehension a lot. So if I underscore close in this string in the columns, then then we get that. So you will get um, uh, only nineteen elements of the features. You know, instead of uh, 95 features we uh, previously identified, so we can use this. Um, uh, let's see the value. You can you can check the value of this list. So it's all related to close price, uh, like uh, one day apart, two day apart, three days apart, four days apart, until 19 days apart. Okay, suppress it. Um, I use Bocci to compute the similarities or compute the distance 
um, in a um, for 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 items. So uh, Botry is a very uh, efficient, very fast uh, package or method to compute um, distance for for matrix. Uh, and actually, uh, K K means use Botry to calculate uh, the distance in when when we do the clustering using the K means. Um, so first, we want to get um, all the close related features in the time frame, in, in the data frame, and convert that into a matrix. So that's how we do it. Just convert as underscore matrix, just convert a data frame and put that values into a matrix. Then uh, generate a bar tree, um, which is a model, has all the uh, distance calculated uh, using the matrix we defined above. Uh, we need to define the metric uh, for the distance. By default, we would use the Minkowski uh, as the distance metric. And um, uh, and by default, uh, the second default is we'll use P equal to two. So we'll use Euclidean, Euclidean distance to compute uh, the distance between two vectors. So uh, <clears throat> I probably forgot to now uh, it generate a tree um, object. Uh, if you are wondering what the tree is, we can just type tree. You will say it's a uh, uh, it's from SK Learn neighbors package from bot tree. It's a bot tree package. It's a bot tree uh, object. I'm sorry. Then um, then we want to get the um, the the value the vector for for the um, for the flower.com, which it would be uh, the item we want to uh, we want to query similar items for. So because that's the first item, so we just use ix and the first row and all the columns and turn that into float. Um, so you will have uh, you can check what this data is. So it's just a um, a series and with um, float 64 as the type. Um, when we compute the, um, do the similarity computation, when we do um, the query of similar items, we need to define what's the threshold, what, what, what's, the, what's the similarity? So how we define the similarity? The similarity here is defined by the distance threshold. Uh, it's also called a radius. So I will define the threshold as 1.5 and pass that number to R. Uh, then query all the um, elements which within, uh, which has a distance within this radius. Then you will get, um, uh, going too fast. Okay, now you have um, um, the index and the distance. You can check what's the value of that. And index is just a 2D variable with, uh, with the index of the similar items. And the distance is also a 2D, um, 2D array, uh, 2D array uh, with the distance information. Um, uh, each value is the distance of uh, one item to the original item uh, we, we queried for. And we can get all the symbols uh, for the similar stocks to this flower stock. So these are all the stocks which have similar behaviors, similar price change in close uh, for, for, for flowers. So pass that. Then we can sort the symbols. We can put the, um, the, the most similar uh, stock up front, then you will get you will just uh, so definitely the first is itself. Then see what's the second. I'm sorry. So it should be. Let me get the second is AGFS. So this guy is the uh, is the, the 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 most similar stock to the flower.com. So you can get a list of them. Get the first uh, nine or ten. No. 
doesn't work. You can get the second, uh, then it's ARCI. <clears throat> okay, uh, let's just move on to the visualization visual, visualization of the, of the network. I already wrote some function to generate a uh, network uh, file. Uh, I probably, for, for the sake of time, I will uh, skip that part. Then I will use network X um, to generate a graph. So I import the network X as a network package, then initiate or create a graph object, uh, define the edge list, and uh, as we did before, define a threshold for the distance. Then uh, import a, another package just for uh, generating the graph file. Uh, it's called semant um, semantic net. Import that, then just double check the symbols we have. We have 201 symbols. And for each of them, we want to just take the last day of price change and uh, identify how similar they are. If they are similar enough, you know, just for each of them, for each of the symbol in my symbols, um, I query the data, uh, get the, the last of the elements. Um, then, then um, get the uh, similar stocks to the current stock. Then, um, then get the symbols of the similar stocks. So get the uh, similar symbols. If the length, if if this stock does have similar stocks, then we put that into graph. Add a node, then add an add edge. Okay, let's just run this. Okay, it's already done. It's very fast. Then uh, what we have here is uh, is the data. Then we once we have generated the graph, we can check how many nodes we have. You know, we have one, uh, 201 because we have 201 stocks. Then we have 201 um, nodes. Then you can check how many edges you have. You have. Uh, 1498 close to like 1500 edges um, then we can check um, how many connected component in this graph then uh, just run this connected component subgraphs function in network X then you can check the length of subgraphs the, the connected components uh, we have 81 uh, components most of them just single single point uh, we can see that then then we want to sort the components based on the number of nodes and uh, get the first the biggest component which has 117 nodes in this component um, use network X you can calculate the degree centrality of um, a connected component like here, you can get the uh, degree centrality for each node in this component. Um, then sort them uh, based on the value. You know the the most um, the the stock which the the node which has the highest degree centrality would be the first. Uh, you can do the same thing to calculate the betweenness centrality, eigenvector centrality, and the page rank centrality. Uh, I want to draw a a um, diagram for a subgram for a subgraph for a component uh, the, compo uh, the connected component. Like this is the biggest one. You see, it's very busy, very crowded. Uh, it, it basically cannot see anything out of it. But I have a a better way to visualize this uh, network graph. So uh, I, I will use the function I created before and uh, take the, um, the graph we just created, then put that into a JSON file. I already generated that file. So basically, I will just, um, just run. Sorry. 
Okay, so it shows the network of these uh, 201 stocks and I color code the uh, connected component then visualize this guy. Okay, so you will see um, the, the graph expanding and um, for the connected graph uh, it has a, a single color uh, for, for each of the connected graph, you have a single color. You can zoom in, um, like this guy um, is a the largest component we have, which has more than 100 nodes in it. Um, and you can see what the stocks in it. Um, so, so that's a fancy visualization of this network. Um, yep. Okay, um, let's get back. <clears throat> so the next is, um, you know, uh, we want to predict the, the closing price or whatever price for a particular stock based on the historical, historical price uh, we have already retrieved. So uh, we can do regression. We can use regression, build a regression model and, um, and uh, estimate the price for a particular stock. So let's first import the regression, the linear regression package. Then uh, let's come back to Amazon, uh, define the start date and the end date uh, in this year. Uh, actually, we are using more than two years worth of data uh, going from 2006, January 1st to, to uh, March 22nd, 2016. And just read all the data, it's already here. You can see it's super fast. Then we have uh, 2,572 data points uh, already retrieved. Then we generate the features. Um, to calculate, just basically calculate the uh, price change using the closed data. Now uh, we have um, 121 columns, which you know, uh, including the features we just generated. We uh, we subtract the feature columns as we did, and target would be. Um, uh, indicated by a D underscore. So that will be the target variable we want to predict. And uh, the target is uh, the, the next closing price uh, for Amazon. And we need to shift um, shift the, the target price for by, by two position, then drop all the um, missing value uh, then get the new ship. So we have we still have 2,552 2, data points. Then, then generate a, um, a training matrix. Uh, now the shape only have 100, uh, 114 features. Then get the uh, endant variables. Now we have, we can look at what, we have um, the same number of rows, but just a single column. Um, so it's all all the predicted, uh, you know, it's all the price change we want to predict. So they initiate um, a linear regression object, then we already did a shape check, uh, then just fit use the, the uh, training matrix and uh, uh, ver the dependent variable, the target uh, variable, and the, and the fit is just the linear regression model. And it's done. So it will return a linear regression model uh, with all the you know, um, related information. Now we want to do the prediction of the change. Um, so we'll predict the um, the last day of the uh, the closing price will give you a calculated um, regression uh, fit for this price change. Then we can compute the um, the predicted the real the predicted stock price based on the previous day's closing price, because 
what we have predicted is a, is a rate, is a change rate. So it's a five hundred and fifty eight dollars. And what's the real um, price is five hundred and fifty two dollars. It's pretty close, you, you would say, but it's hard to draw. It's, it's very hard to judge based on the absolute value. Um, a lot of time, what we want to predict is um, the stock is going up or down. So we just turn that problem, regression problem, into a classification. It's a binary classification problem. We want to predict the stock in the next day would be going up or down. So either zero or one. Uh, we can do that using the logistic regression to do the classification. Uh, turn the uh, the price price change uh, data we have generated before into a binary. So if the price price change is above zero, uh, then it's up. Then we'll say it's one. If it's below zero, if it's negative, uh, we'll give a zero for this for this category categorical target variable. So create a logistic regression model, then fit this new data. Uh, into this model, then the model is trained. Then do the com computation. So the prediction would be um, the value either zero or one. So the cav caveat I want to give here is that we didn't do any feature selection here. So basically, we use all the features to train a logistic regression model. That's a very bad idea. So we will do some feature selection later. Um, so the prediction of this very lousy logistic regression is is going down. So uh, it says the next next day uh, the Amazon stock would going down, but actually uh, it's going up. It's it's positive. The price change is positive. So it's not right. Um, so. We can try other classifiers. Uh, the second one I would like to try is the random forest classifier from Scikit-Learn. Then just import that, initiate, and then fit this model. Then do the prediction. Uh, it still tell you uh, the stock would go down. Then I want to try another one. It's called gradient boosting classifier. You import that. Uh, you can see that the good thing of using Scikit-Learn is it just basically follow the same workflow. Import this package, then create a object of this model, then just call fit function to to use the training data to fit the model. Uh, because I didn't initiate this. Okay, now it takes some time. The gradient boosting is a little bit slower uh, than random forest. So the model is trained, then I can do the prediction. Oh, it's still, <clears throat> it says still going down, what's going on? So it's really hard to predict uh, a stock market going up or down. So if it's that easy, everybody can be rich. But anyway, that's that. I just want to demonstrate the, the process. You know, I, I don't want to show how, how you know, magic it is to do a stock prediction, but you know, we, we try. Um, so use the gradient boosting model, we can identify the important features, uh, use the feature underscore importances underscore and get the uh, important features and sort them based on the score. Then you can see what they are. Um, so this is a list of the important uh, features for for uh, for this prediction. Now we can, you know, um, because we're always dealing with high dimensional data. You know, the feature uh, dimensionality reduction is something we cannot avoid. Uh, one thing I um, I would like to try is to use Tisney uh, to do um, the. Uh, dimensionality and also visualize uh, what the data look like. Uh, if there's any clusters, if there's any group of the data points, uh, because Tisney is very good to map a high dimensional data points into a low dimension space and the, and the preserve the um, closeness between between the data points when when the transformation is done. So let's first import this package and uh, project this high dimension space into a two 
uh, 2D space. So the n components equal to 2, then uh, fit this data uh, and use this function to generate, um, de define a scatter uh, function uh, which we will use to generate a scatter plot for just visualize um, still running. You know, the TSNI will take some time. It's not the fastest way uh, of doing uh, the dimensionality reduction. Uh. Okay, it's still fading. Um, let me check the status. Uh, if I lose everybody already. Um, yeah, I didn't do evaluation because uh, that will need a lot of data points. Um, so considering, you know, it will take some time to retrieve the data. So I didn't do a full round of um, model building and the model validation, model evaluation. So uh, probably we can do that um, in the future. Then we have the, okay, we already trained the TSNI data, then TSNI model. Um, then we can create the scatter plots. So this is a, you know, it's not the prettiest one I've ever generated, but it just gives you the idea of that all the data points that are close to each other. So there's no um, distinct uh, clusters in our data points. So it's, you know, that, that makes sense because um, the stock price, especially the stock, Price changes. They are uh, they they follow the process of random walk, so um, they're more like random numbers generated. So there there should not be very clear clusters in the data points. So it's, it's not a surprise to me. It just shows a, a big blob of uh, of data points. But I just want to show you the process of how we use TSNI to visualize a high dimensional data in a two D space. Then the next, the, the last thing I want to sh I want to demonstrate is the feature selection. So we can use Scikit-Learn to do the feature selection. Scikit-Learn has a uh, package called the Select Select the K Best, and uh, has also the P PCA, the Principal Component Analysis method, to um, decrease dimensionality. Then we import that. Then uh, first we uh, get the PCA the the, the the most the two uh, um, the two most principal components in uh, the PCA analysis. Then select the um, eight best features in our feature set and put them together. Then use the combined feature to fit this logistic regression model. Uh, then get the shape. Um, so the selection, we have uh, selected eight um, best scores, best features. We can, you can see what, what they are. So, um, so here we are listing eight uh, best features we have chosen. Uh, it's very interesting. They just choose the most recent uh, price changes. So, so when the when the date gets far away, like uh, more than six days away, the information will be less and less valuable in the prediction. Then we use the selected features to do the logistic regression again, train the model, then um, just check the, fe the, the, the shape of the uh, features, then test um, do the prediction. La la, you see the prediction is right. You know, um, the prediction we got before is all zero. So uh, it says the market, the stock price would go down. But actually, after we have done the feature selection and they reduce the features from more than 100 features into only uh, eight, 10 features and build a logistic regression model upon this 10 uh, features, then uh, it get the right prediction. Um, 
the model validation we cannot cover here. We are running out of the, we already have uh, very close to the one, one hour and a half mark. So I will basically um, stop here. Um, so I probably will just answer questions offline. And um, thank you all and have a good night.